Good morning once again and welcome to today's session on the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So we're going to cover two books today in this session. So before we could begin with our class, uh, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Yes, Sid, please go ahead. Go ahead, Sid. Thank you for the time you had given us, Lord. We pray for, we pray and we thank you as we are going to learn from the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Lord, as Ezra and Nehemiah has done, Lord, the great things for your kingdom, the great thing for the people of Israel, Lord. We might be do also something, Lord, for your kingdom, Lord, that we might be remembered in the book of life, Lord. Our name should be written in the book of life. We thank you for the ma'am. We thank you for all the students. We thank you for we thank you for the time you have given us, Lord. The hour we are going to spend in your in your presence, Lord. That it should be used as a golden opportunity, Lord. Whatever we are going to learn, Lord, it should be in our heart. We should keep in our mind. We should practice it daily, Lord. We thank you for this time. The thank you for the opportunity you have given us, Lord. Use us, make us the vessel that it should be used. And Lord, break us. You are our potter, Lord. We are your clay. Make us, Lord, break us, do whatever you want to do with us, Lord. Not our will, but your will be done as in heaven, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Okay. So before I could begin the class, I will just share the screen with you on the book. Yeah, I think everyone can see now. <clears throat> okay. So the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, I'll be making it very simple the way that we can understand it won't be like uh, too much of battle it won't be about talking about many kings but then very simple very simple in the way that we could understand and i'm sure today's class will be much more interesting than it was uh before with regards to the battles and wars and you know people disobeying but here it is something more different there's a passion in this whole book and also we can compare ourselves to Ezra and Nehemiah. <clears throat> so the author of these books are both Ezra and Nehemiah because Nehemiah wrote much and, you know, Ezra took uh, the biography of Nehemiah and he tried to uh, uh, write in Ezra. But then the author is both in the book of Ezra and uh, for book of Nehemiah. So the compilation was probably completed in about 430 BC in Jerusalem. And we see Ezra. The word in Hebrew means Ezer. In Hebrew, Ezra is called as Ezer, which means help. Perhaps it also means Yahweh's help. Ezra and Nehemiah were originally, uh, you know, born together as one book. Just like how we saw the book of Samuel, the book of Kings, and then we saw the book of Chronicles. They were like one single book. Ezra and Nehemiah were viewed as one continuous history. So Ezra continues uh, the Old Testament narration of the second Chronicles from where it was stopped. It continues from there by showing how God fulfills his promise to return his people to the promised land. That is after 70 years of exile. So God is with these people. And although their days of, uh, you know, was uh, glory seems over, but their spiritual heritage remained in them. So God's rich promises have been fulfilled. We see, um, where did we see Israel's first exodus
from where did israel return in the first exodus egypt from egypt no. yes so israel left egypt and came back to the promised land and now we see the second exodus that is israelites are returning returning uh, to babylon they are returning to babylon is less impressive than the return from egypt because uh, only a remnant chooses to leave babylon so ezra relates the story of two returns from babylon the first led by zerubbabel who rebuilt the temple we see that in the book of ezra chapter 1 to 6 and the second under the leadership of ezra himself to rebuild the spiritual condition of the people that we see from chapter 7 to chapter 10 and then in book of nehemiah chapter 1 to 7 we see nehemiah returning to uh, israel uh, uh, to build the city walls of jerusalem okay so uh, and we also see in between the book the first led by zerubbabel and the second led by ezra in between uh, there's about two accounts and in these between these two accounts there is a gap of about 6 decades during which esther lives and rules as a queen in persia we will also be covering in detail about esther when we study the book of esther and uh, today spe uh, specifically we are going to focus on the three key leaders that is zerubbabel ezra and nehemiah these are the three key leaders who we are going to study on so zerubbabel leads a large group of people from jerusalem uh, uh, back to jerusalem to rebuild the temple uh, then about uh, 70, uh, 60 years later we see ezra arrives in jerusalem to teach the torah and rebuild the spiritual community among them and after that following him we see nehemiah leads Uh, a group of uh, israelites to uh, to jerusalem to rebuild the broken walls so uh, and after uh, these three uh, stories uh, it is parallel okay this is the time when queen esther also reigns so let's see chapter 1 from the book of ezra the story begins with a decree from the king cyrus who's mentioned about 30 times in the bible and it is identified as uh, this king cyrus he is also known as the cyrus the great or cyrus second or cyrus the elder who reigned over the persia between 539 bc to 530 bc and this pagan king is very important in the jewish history because it was under his rule that jews were first allowed to return to israel after 70 years of captivity and this also reminds about uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy which was made by prophet jeremiah that exiles would one day return back to jerusalem if one can turn to jeremiah 29 verse 10 or i can read this verse because it's only one scripture maybe much later you all can take turns and read the truth is that you will be in babylon for 70 years but then i will come and do all the good things i have promised i will bring you home back again so this is a clear promise that uh, god made a uh, prophesied through jeremiah and also in second chronicles uh, uh, chapter 36 verse 22 to 23 we see that cyrus decree releasing the jewish people so now in the first year of cyrus king of persia you know he releases he, uh, he, he he releases a decree to be released now this fulfillment should trigger a hope in many of other prophetic promises that exile was not the end of the story because uh, you know uh, you know in the last book in the previous book of the chronicles we saw like how the bab uh, because of the sin of the israelites who who, who sinned against god and uh, you know worshiping the uh, other other pagan gods and they built the altars and this related uh, you know god's grace or god to move away from them uh, god's grace to move away from them and the other kings came and invaded especially babylon came and invaded the southern kingdom and the assyrians took over the northern kingdom 
And when the Babylonians came and invaded the southern kingdom, they completely destroyed the Jerusalem. Whatever Solomon built, you know, the, uh, um, the one of the wonder, the temple, which was one of the wonder, they completely destroyed the temple and they burnt it. They broke the walls of Jerusalem. It led to ruins. And now when this King Cyrus sends back the people, send them to go build your temple. Now we see under the leadership of Zerubbabel, Okay, Zerubbabel comes with a set of people, uh, you know, uh, to build the temple at Jerusalem. We see uh, return to uh, 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 this return to uh, uh, return to Jerusalem took place in three stages first time they came under the leadership of zerubbabel who was the governor okay he came with few set of israelites to build to rebuild the temple and uh, the uh, under the leadership which was ordered by king cyrus he came up uh, he came of about 50000 jews along with hegai and zechariah and later we see in 458 bc ezra the scribe to revive the people in uh, uh, you know uh, and to build them spiritually he comes under the order of king zesarus the jewish males only there were about 2000 jewish males who came along with ezra to jerusalem and later we see in 444 bc nehemiah a reformer he was also a governor Okay, that is after a hundred years. Okay, after Zerubbabel, he reigned as a governor and he came to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, uh, the gates of the city under the order of King Atazarus. So, this is what we see in the book of Ezra. Okay, now we will talk about Zerubbabel who came to rebuild the temple and we see that in the book of Ezra chapter 1 verse 1, I mean chapter 1 to 6 we see that Zerubbabel, he came and his name means planted in Babylon. He was a leader of the tribe of Judah, he was part of the first wave of Jewish captive when they returned to Jerusalem from Babylon. So the Persian king appointed Zerubbabel as a governor of Judah and right away Zerubbabel began rebuilding the temple with the help of Jeshua, the high priest. So the first temple was built by whom? Let's pop up some quiz here. The first temple was built by whom? King Solomon. King Solomon. And how many years did he take to build the temple? Okay, King Solomon took seven years to build the temple. He took seven years and that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. We see that when we study the book of Kings and it took Zerubbabel two years to rebuild only the foundation of the temple. And when Zerubbabel uh, 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 started with the foundation of the temple, we see in chapter four in the book of Ezra, Chapter 4, we see the grandchildren of the Israelites who were in uh, Jerusalem, uh, uh, who were not taken in the exile and who were living in Jerusalem. They came uh, saying uh, to offer help to Zerubbabel in rebuilding the temple. But Zerubbabel refused to take any help from them. And this led to a conflict. And uh, because of the conflict, the construction was delayed. And it resulted in, uh, you know, in uh, King Persia to withdraw the support from the project. And for about 17 years, the temple work was paused or it was unfinished. For 17 years, the work was ceased. And finally, again, God sent the prophets like Haggai and Zechariah to encourage and support Zerubbabel. We see that in chapter 5. And the work on the second temple resumed back. So it took four years to complete after that. After 17 years, when they started this uh, work, it took four years to complete it. 
So in 516 BC, the temple was completed and it was dedicated with great, uh, you know, great honor. So we see Ezra who came in uh, with 2000 people. He gathered all the Israelites and uh, the Jews and the Jews also observed the Passover. We see that in uh, chapter six. Zerubbabel is never mentioned from here on. From here on, we see Ezra taking over in connection with the dedication of the ceremonies, nor in mentioning again, um, you know, after Ezra chapter 5, we don't see Zerubbabel. For the reason Zerubbabel's temple is often referred to simply as the second temple of Zerubbabel. So the Lord was pleased with Zerubbabel's effort in returning the captives to Jerusalem and starting and, and started to build the second temple and he re-established the temple worship. Uh, yeah, with this, uh, God, uh, he did everything with the prompting of God and he was led by God. And Haggai and, uh, gave Zerubbabel a special blessing. We see that in the book of Haggai chapter 2 verse 23 that uh, in that day, say the Lord of host, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheetil, said the Lord, and will make thee a signet, for I have chosen thee, said the Lord of hosts. So the second temple was being built, and there was a group of Jews in Jerusalem who were rather disappointed. Why? Uh, Yes, they were, the, the younger generation were very happy to see the new temple built. But the older generation, the older Jews who happened to see the Solomon's temple during its dedication, they saw the glory of God descend from heaven. There was a, there was a cloud of fire on the temple when they saw that glory. But that was not the same glory when they dedicated the second temple because... The Ark of the Covenant was not in the temple. They have lost it during when Babylon invaded. The Ark of the Covenant was taken from the temple and they didn't return it. So the temple was built and dedicated without the Ark of the Covenant. And also, um, you know, it was not uh, Solomon built with greater gan uh, grandeur. Like uh, he had all the resources what he had. And, you know, there were other kingdoms who came and helped him with silver and gold. So he could build the temple much more beautiful. But then Zerubbabel took the help of this King Persia to rebuild the temple. But whatever resources that he received, he gave his best to the temple. Okay, so... Yes, there were older Jews who saw that uh, Solomon temple, they sat, but in their mind, it not even uh, begin to compare the splendor of Solomon's temple with Zerubbabel's temple because uh, Zerubbabel's temple was in a smaller scale with very few resources, but Solomon's temple had housed uh, you know, with silver and gold and with many precious stones. And more than anything, the Ark of the Covenant was there and God's presence was there on the temple. The whole temple was filled with the Shekinah glory of God. But then that then happened in the second dedication of the temple. So Haggai prophesied this on the second temple uh, would one day have a magnificence of outshine the glory of the first temple. So Haggai words was fulfilled by 500 years later when Jesus himself arrived and he walked in Zerubbabel's temple. Yes, we all see say that the glory was not there. That which was there in the Solomon's temple was not there in the Zerubbabel's temple. But then Haggai prophesied saying Jesus himself will be there. And this was fulfilled much later. That is 500 years later when Jesus was there on the earth. He walked in that temple. He was the Shekinah glory, the, uh, the presence of God, God himself. He was there moving in this temple. He walked through the courts of the temple, which Zerubbabel built. So this was it about uh, Zerubbabel. And God honored him. God blessed him. God gave him the authority. God gave him the favor with the kings. God gave the favor with the people. God supported him with the vision that he impressed in his heart. So with this, we will move on to study on Ezra.
Ezra. Ezra chapter 7. Let's turn to chapter 7. Ezra was the second of the three key leaders that we would be discussing who, who left Babylon for the reconstruction of Jerusalem. So Zerubbabel reconstructed the temple. Nehemiah, later we will study, he will be rebuilding the walls of the Jerusalem. And Ezra is restoring the spiritual worship among the people of Jewish people. So Ezra was a scribe and priest. He was sent with the religious and political power by the king of Persia, uh, Atazarus, who led another group of Jewish exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem. And Ezra wanted to bring about spiritual and social renewal among the people. So Ezra condemned mixed marriages uh, and encouraged Jews to divorce and banish their foreign wives. So what happened when Ezra came to uh, uh, Jerusalem. He came with a greater expectation. He came with a greater expectation, uh, expecting, you know, uh, the uh, Jews would be in the same way when they left the Jerusalem. But for his surprise, you know, Jews had married the uh, pagan women. Uh, a pagan women and they had they taken up wives from the pagan culture. And this frustrated Ezra because because uh, just like what happened to Solomon may ha may happen, or it was happening in this time as well, where the uh, the Israel men were influenced by these uh, pagan wives to worship the pagan gods and go into the temple offer sacrifice. So Ezra was frustrated, and that's why uh, he condemns this mixed marriages and encourages Jews to divorce and banish their foreign wives and again he, this was not uh, he didn't consult god uh, to uh, to release a decree of or to proclaim a decree of divorce but then he consulted the leaders in jerusalem he consulted the leaders and with the help of leaders he proclaims this degree of divorce and not everyone took this seriously but there were very few Jerusalem men, um, the Jewish men who took it seriously and they divorced their wife and sent their wife and children back to their place. And, you know, they came, but not many were for it. Yeah. We also see uh, Ezra taking help from this king, uh, Persian king to authorize uh, finance uh, the trip and Ezra to teach God's people his law. So he uh, he takes the help of this Persian king and then uh, uh, he tries to teach his, uh, teaches the book of law, the Torah to the Jewish men or Jewish people. And the same king also helped Nehemiah uh, to restore some measure of uh, 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 to restore and rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. So uh, Ezra effective ministry includes the teaching of the word of God and initiating reforms, restoring the worship in the temple and leading, uh, leading uh, the Jewish people in spiritual revival in Jerusalem. So uh, Ezra, <coughs> Ezra, uh, you know, prayed and asked Lord to change the situation. And we also see in this book later that, uh, you know, he was so frustrated with the heart of people, even in spite of his teaching or him uh, proclaiming this degree, not many were reacting to it. So this uh, was little uh, difficult or frustrating to Ezra. So he cries out to the Lord, asking to change, uh, asking God to change the situation. And he also, we see that he blames himself for not being able to change people's heart. And we know that we cannot change anyone's heart, but it is God. So Ezra seeks God to change 
the people's heart. So he wanted people to know that how important and essential the word of God is and how important it is for us to live our life as per the word of God and nothing should supersede the worship of God. He is bringing the priority in people's heart. God should be a priority and he is also asking them obedience is not an option. Very important. And even for us, it is obedience is not an option, uh, but it is a must. The sovereign God looks over and protects his children always uh, the, to the one who keeps his promise and uh, providing encouragement through those. He, he, he sends a word to all the Jewish people saying, with his plan to uh, interpret the scriptures to them and you know how he can rebuild each and every one spiritually and we see that god steps in on time to continue his plan and we see god and in intimately involved in the lives of people through ezra and in ezra's life as well and uh, sometimes we see uh, the things around us may be impossible, just like how Ezra felt it was impossible to change the uh, Jewish people heart because it's been uh, very long. These people uh, were born and grew at the time of exile and they didn't even see the power of God or the glory of God. They have not read the Torah. They were not aware what the word of God is. Their lives were so much, uh, uh, we can say, polluted with the pagan God, pagan kind. Culture. So Ezra is coming to restore uh, back uh, the discipline in the Jewish people by teaching them the word of God. Because um, one thing we should know uh, is, uh, you know, people won't listen to our words. There's no power in when we speak, but there's power in the word of God. So that's the reason where Ezra time and again teaches Torah to people because that's God's word and that carries power and that has the power to change the person inside out from heart. So Ezra puts in all his effort, though it is an impossible situation, but Ezra does not depend on himself, but he depends on God. And we see the hand of Lord upon Ezra. So when he thought people changed, people turned back, people repented, we need to believe that every believer is a living temple. Every believer is a living temple. So that's how. And uh, we have the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Because that's what the New Testament says, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And um, so in the days of Ezra, people were evil in their heart. But then when he started teaching the word, people repented. They transformed. Their hearts were changed. And so our goal today should be that to teach the word of God, and for us also as an individual, as a believer, we should know that we are the living temple and we need to be rooted and grounded in the word so that we can teach another, teach yeah. others through this word what we learn. So with this, and this leads us to the next person, Nehemiah. Let me change to Nehemiah. Okay, before we could <clears throat> go to Nehemiah, we'll just see some interesting facts about the Zerubbabel's temple. It was the second, Israel's second temple. It was built after the return from Babylon captivity. The Jews had been home for 16 years, and we see Zerubbabel's temple stood for 500 years. And this temple exceeded the dimension of Solomon's temple. It was much bigger than the Solomon's temple in magnificence in magnificence and splendor Zerubbabel's temple did not compare with Solomon's temple and Zerubbabel's temple did not have the ark of the covenant then we see the work of restoration of Jerusalem went on 70 years after the temple was built the prophets Haggai and Zechariah encouraged the work on the temple and we also see Ze uh, Ezra focused on attention of the degree of Cyrus and Haggai stressed the need to rebuild the temple that is when it was the work was pro uh, paused and Zechariah predicted the rebuilding of the temple in his book so here we see the key events, the captive return to Jerusalem with Zerubbabel, the temple work begins, the temple work was completed, Ezra preparation for ministry. Yeah, and uh, during this time, Ezra dedicated the temple, the finished temple. 
and he also try to reestablish the spiritual values among the Jews. With this, we will move on to Nehemiah. So who is Nehemiah? We can turn to book of Nehemiah chapter one. Nehemiah. Who is Nehemiah? We already covered about him. Nehemiah was a cupbearer of the king. Yes, he was a cupbearer. Correct. Okay. So the Hebrew name of Nehemiah was Nehemiah, which means comfort of Yahweh. The book is named after its chief character, whose name appears in the opening verse. He was a man of patriotism and courage, and he was fearless. We see that as we study about him, we see all these characteristics that he was enthusiastic. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of hard work, one who feared God and sought for God's blessing. And the book has been divided into two divisions. Chapter 1 to 7, we see the reconstruction of the wall. And uh, chapter 8 to 13, we see the restoration of people. So Nehemiah was an Israelite official serving in the Persian government as a cup bearer. But much later, he was also appointed as the governor of Jerusalem for two terms. Nehemiah begins 13 years after the end of Ezra or 100 years after the return of Zerubbabel. So the early days of King Artaxerxes. I am I'm not sure whether I'm spelling it, pronouncing it exactly. So Nehemiah's brother Ahani, okay? Uh, so he comes with a delegation of Jews brought to Nehemiah a report concerning the condition of Jerusalem. So the city wall lay in ruin and gates were still burnt in condition. And this news, you know, disturbed Nehemiah's heart. He grieved when he, when he heard this news from his brother. And what he did, we see in chapter 1, verse 2 to 11, we see that, you know, he started to fast and pray fast and pray to God because he is under captive. He is working, serving under the king. He cannot do anything much. So only the Lord can do things. So he started to pray. And when he prayed, you see, you know, he was a man of prayer. When he prayed, God heard his prayer. God heard his prayer. And God moved king, king's heart. Where the king noticed Nehemiah was sad. And, you know, the long story is short and, you know, King inquired and he grants permission to lead a remnant to return to Jerusalem. This is the third batch of people, third wave of people who were returning to Jerusalem on a particular mission to rebuild the walls and gates of Jerusalem. The king even gave them an armed escort and all the resources so that after arriving to Jerusalem, they could start building this project. Um, you know, uh, they had a mission. So Nehemiah carried out this vision for the city with much integrity and courage. Nehemiah continued in his quest to rebuild the Jerusalem wall. So God provided all the necessary workers. The building began. However, during the time of building, there were these local people who, uh, who also uh, interrupted the work of Zerubbabel in building the temple, the same kind of people started to oppose uh, uh, Nehemiah's work. So those who uh, uh, desired to stop the rebuilding, you know, he never gave up. They had to fight back. And they had to build the city with the armed guards. You see everywhere the armed guards were there with the arrow to protect the others to build the wall. And, you know, it was a record breaking. They could complete building the wall within 52 days with the help of God.
record they planned you know a uh, very uh, well leadership planning under nehemiah if any of us wanted to learn about the leadership skills how nehemiah planned how he worked out uh, with the people that he had with him and how he could complete the uh, it is a very big task but he completed in 52 days is much greater because he didn't wanted uh, to face the uh, um, pause in his work just like how zerubbabel faced in his time while building the temple of god so he uh, accumulated the strength he planned uh, he came up with the strategies and um, he could build the wall of jerusalem with a handful of people whom he had with him within 52 days so when we read the book of nehemiah we see the leadership skill in nehemiah how he delegated the work how they planned how they strategized how they went on with this work night and day very interesting to read and we see god a god's hand on his life here uh, how uh, how he could complete this work and in nehemiah 8:18 can we turn to nehemiah chapter 8 verse 18 can one of us please read nehemiah 8 18 he read from the book of the law of god daily from the first day to the last day and they celebrated the feast seven days and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance thank you john <clears throat> so we see ezra and nehemiah combine forces to bring a spiritual renewal among the people they gather all the exiles together for a festival and they read and they taught the torah that is the god's word to all the people of israel for seven days continuously and then they celebrated the ancient feast of tabernacles to remember god's faithfulness from the exodus and the wilderness journey then they offered a confession of their sins and they vowed themselves to renew the covenant follow all the commands of torah and they finished with a great celebration over the temple and the walls of jerusalem and we are thinking uh, this could be the turning point but it's not the end was um, you know uh, we see that nehemiah to round the city he finds the people have not been fulfilling the covenant vows there were certain people who followed the torah the teaching the change of heart but not everyone were for it and uh, you know when nehemiah went around the city he found people uh, not giving the same reverence to the temple to the sacrifices or to the city wall they made the city wall as a market place for them so all this was very disheartening for nehemiah so zerubbabel's work is undone as he find the temple been neglected and the staff has been unqualified people <coughs> and people were compromising on the, on the uh, on the word of god that's the torah uh, he also noticed for jewish people to work on a sabbath is something uh unlawful for them and when when they noticed all this so nehemiah he goes on a rampage and you know he starts beating up people because no matter how much they have thought they have said people are not changing so he just goes and he he starts beating people and he literally pulls the hair of some people and he yells at them and you know and he says and he sh- yells at them saying that obey the command of torah keep the word of god and we see in the final words are the prayer that god would remember him and he just prays lord i have done my best whatever i could and he just leads this prayer lord i hope that you will remember me in uh, the last verse last verse uh, <clears throat> chapter 13 verse 29 we see remember them oh my god because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the levites thus i cleanse them of everything pagan i also assigned duties to the priest 
and the Levites, each to his service, and to bring the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed things. Remember me, O oh my God, for oh good. EJ submits to God's hand. Everything. He said, Lord, I've done my best, and now you take care. So what do we learn from the personal life of Nehemiah? What do we learn from his life? A man who gives utmost interest to the word of God and yes. discipline. Yes. Though, though he had many opposition, but he was faithful and he perceived in what God had called him to do. He was stirred within him. We also see his leadership skill, the wisdom of God in him and planning and, you know, executing this complete work, the complete wall building work to be completed within 52 days. And also how to safeguard from the enemy, from them not, um, you know, overpowering or stopping the work or the vision that he came to Jerusalem for. We also see, though he was in exile, the pagan land, we see that he never wavered from his faith. If you take up uh, Zerubbabel or Ezra or Nehemiah, though they were in the pagan land, they never wavered in their faith. They trusted in the God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob will one day bring us out, one day take us out from this exile and we will rebuild the temple, we will rebuild all this uh, kind of hope was burning within them that led them to step out as a leader. But then we also see the Israelites who were living in Jerusalem, but they didn't have the fire, the passion, what these people carried, though they were in the pagan land. You know, we see these uh, people who, who were left out, you know, uh, from the captive. They, they, they were not taken away in captive. They were there in the land of uh, Jerusalem. But they, uh, you know, gave in. Uh, to the pagan culture, they got married to the, uh, they took the pagan uh, girls as their wives and everything were changed. And we see when we studied about Ezra, he was disheartened, he was frustrated. This was not what Ezra expected from the Jew Jews who stayed back in Jerusalem. It was actually much shocking for him to see. Okay, later. And we also see uh, Nehemiah, he was also a prayer warrior. He put everything in God's hand. He interceded for his people. He interceded for the king. And we see how Lord moved and worked in and through him. He was a man of diligence and perseverance. Nehemiah, we also see Nehemiah had a caring heart for people. Yes, uh, because of that care and when he saw people rebelling against God is when he could not take it. He had to whip them and pull out their hair and yell at them. But then it was again to bring the people back to God. And then, you know, by doing that, we cannot bring anyone turn their heart. It should come from within. But then he leaves that to the hand of God. That is the right way to do. He leaves it to the hand of God and he says, Lord, I've done what I can do. And now you restore your children. So this is what we study on Nehemiah. And the three key leaders. That is Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. So over to class, what was one point, what we learned from Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah? Can I, can I say? Yes, please. I think what I've learned from Nehemiah in particular is his commitment to the call that build the, the broken walls in the temple. I also have learned something from 
how Nehemiah did not want to compromise his his calling. So he refused to accept uh, offerings from people who were not committed to the cause. Many other times, uh, many people would want to compromise our callings by offering us um, certain guilt and and motivations. We shouldn't be we shouldn't be entangled in those things. I also learned the prayer prayer habit of Nehemiah. He did not relent on his strength, his even his uh, association with the king. But rather, he sought the face of God before he embarked on this on his mission. So these are three important lessons that I have learned from Nehemiah. Yes, yes. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you. Yes, Brother Lubega, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, I would have my my contribution in two parts. And as far as humans are concerned, one is the godly people. Uh, the godly people should always understand God's will and uh, do whatever is possible, whatever is best out of the situation. For instance, when you look at Nehemiah and uh, when you look at Zerubbabel and Ezra, these guys really understood that they were under a punishment and they never fought back. They just, they were willing to work with the ungodly people and putting themselves on the right side of the law in the foreign land, and that is Babylon. So that one made them alive. That one kept them alive to fulfill God's purpose. That was going to be, that was going to be, to take place in the next 70 years. Number two is on the side of the ungodly people. It does mean that God, when God has a purpose, he can use any person, either godly or ungodly, to, in order to put his pl plan into action. For instance, he used the kings of the Babylonian government to, to, to fulfill his purpose. So that what was prophesied in the book of Jeremiah, that after 70 years of captiv cap captivity, my people will come back to Jerusalem. And that is what I've learned in the books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Anyone else would like to add on? Um, I want to share, I want to share one more thing. Yes. Again, um, I recognize the, how uh, Ezra, the important role he allowed the word of God to play in the lives of the people. Yes. We also need to lay the word of God as a foundation of, of everything that we are doing. And the word of God, the, the written word of God, and the personified word of God, which is Jesus Christ. When we lay Jesus and his inspired word as the foundation of our lives, everything that we set our hearts to do, everything we set our heart to do, we will be able to do it to the glory of his name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Elijah. <clears throat> Let's pray and close this class. Dear God, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we honor you, Lord. We lift up each of us in this class and also later would we'll be attending this class in your hands. We pray that, Lord, just like how Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah's art burned for you, Lord, to do your will, to do your to fulfill your purpose on this earth. Lord, I pray that you have a call for each of us. You have placed a purpose and a vision that is set in each of us, Lord. We pray that, Lord, you will give us that fire of passion to fulfill it, O oh, Father, that we will persevere, O oh, Father, despite our uh, uh, difficulties, despite our situation, Lord, you will give us the grace to endure and pursue what you have called us, O oh Father. Give us the diligence that is needed to do what you have called us to do, O oh Father. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that you will pour out on each one of us, Lord, and enable us to carry that fire and to fulfill your call, your purpose in this earth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, 
who dwells in us, who will lead us, who will teach us, who will guide us, who will give us the greater wisdom that is needed, O oh Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading us and guiding us and strengthening us in every way of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. I hope it was a blessing to each one. Yes, Pastor. Amen. Yes, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Thank you. God bless.